How do we round this up? How do we round it all up? <coughs> How do we wrap it all up? We don't. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the only answer. <laughs> you simply don't. We'll never wrap it up. And keep unwrapping it. Keep unwrapping it. Keep unfolding it. Unpacking. And there are a few further notes to what we have touched up on outside yesterday morning. I feel like we'll bring it over again, but slightly from a different, more kind of unifying perspective, so that you understand and yet have more reassurance of how to integrate this, what perhaps would feel as somewhat unsettling, as unsettling phase, especially as there's this wave of unfolding and wave of unfoldment. I want you to also be very, very clear about the way this energy works, the way the Shakti unfolds. It's not that, okay, now we left, went back to our homes, and somehow the process has stopped. It's actually going to increase and increase in some of them. <coughs> I, yeah, it's going to increase in some of them. In some of them it might become subtler. In others the kriyas will keep popping out. In others the kriyas might subside. They may be replaced with other kriyas. So essentially you have to be aware that that energy, that beautiful, all-encompassing energy is now, have been awoken and it will do its work. It will do what needs to be done. So this is why it's very important to not to be afraid that it's somehow your lifestyle, your immediate priorities, what you need to do in a day-to-day -day situations, you know, in going about earning the livelihood, being you know, engaged in, in your immediate um, relationships, it's not going to interfere at all. What you need to understand is that <coughs> this power is simultaneously very disruptive. It overthrows everything we have thought about ourselves. Yet at the same time, when there is this acknowledgement it's the supreme intelligence itself. It's the subtlety. It's the subtlety of all relationships. Hence, you will be able to act and interact as long as you do not fight that process. Sometimes you just let yourself be open, just catch that moment, you know, that moment, the repose. If you're busy with people, suddenly you feel the wave is coming you know, speak to that energy. Do not use it as something like, you know, speak to that energy, you know, close your eyes, and, or don't close your eyes, just say, you know, loving Devi, just wait for me, you know, wait for me, just let me just go through this meeting, okay? <laughs> I'll be all yours, just give me a little bit more time. You'll see what happens, you know, just very, very gently. Your attention is required. You're driving you're with little children, with grandchildren, you know, at work. You know, you're at the meeting with the boss. You don't want to lose your job because suddenly you feel like dancing <laughs> Creole, can't you? <laughs> and you felt like dancing on the table of the boss, you know. Felt like... Kind of, <laughs> soon as there is acceptance, soon as there is, soon as we've embraced, it then then finds its most beautiful way 
of how to do this work because there is no such thing as you without that divine power. That's all there is to it. Kundalini is the power behind the individuation. The goddess is the individuation. It's the soul in any of its states. Absolutely all of them. So this is this is a very simple realization that you need to make. It is greater you in you. It's as simple as that. So being afraid of that, it's like being afraid of yourself. That's how I, I feel it is fitting. If I were to make a summary, it's like being afraid of yourself. Why should I be afraid of myself? Myself is beautiful, divine in all its attributes. It has everything. It encompasses the entire universe, the entire creation, and beyond. What is there to afraid? And this is when we embrace that. This is where we begin to embrace that and nothing, absolutely nothing, can go wrong when you have that. If you only understand this, then you will be able to turn the most tumultuous time into the most beautiful time in your life ever. There's nothing, nothing that can be compared to the luster of unfoldment of the Sri Kundalini in her own abode, in her own domain, as this embodied soul. Nothing, no human experience of any kind can come close. And for those of you for whom, for whom this is still a novelty, Enjoy every single moment of it, absolutely every single moment of it. Because believe me, it will go from its spectacular raw state into a progressive degree of subtlety. Where sometimes you can actually will like, you know, slightly, mm, wow, those were the days. <laughs> Those were the years, you know. Because it will, it's bound to find its repose. It will usher and open up a very different, very different phase, much quieter phase, much quieter, filled with other wonders. So embrace it now. Otherwise, if we put up the fight, we'll miss that fun and the goddess will still have her way with us. That's the way of the goddess. Why not to surrender to that? So I just want to perhaps introduce or reintroduce these two other aspects of Shakti. And as we've understood that the three chosen ones represent the whole pantheon of them. They represent all other universal forces. And they just change their form and their character in accord with the situation or in accord with what needs to be performed, what task needs to be performed. If certain aspects need to be slayed, if we need to face certain limitations, then that forceful energy of Durga will be the very weapon with which these limitations will be slayed. When on the other hand we feel like in the midst of this fire, in the midst of this burning, all we need to do is to turn the attention to that benevolent side. And our devotion 
is that very, very attentive gaze and immediately, immediately that benevolence is being showered in the most auspicious and in the most nourishing, supportive way. Know that this is what it means to work working with the universal powers of, of consciousness. This is what it means working with the feminine powers of God. It's removing that dryness of spiritual um, overly intellectualized discourse. Sometimes it's necessary. At certain phase, I would say at the early phases, it's very important to just put things how they are. Cut through the stuff, you know. It's very important. But then we might be running in danger of drying. Hence that richness of understanding that everything is that pulsating, vibrating ocean of consciousness. And although consciousness is pulsating and vibrating as one mass, one mass of awareness, it manifests in a myriad of ways. And there are some universal principles, these universal principles that are embodied by the archetypal shaktis. I would also advise you if the Sanskrit terms somehow still sound remote, to find your own equivalent to the word that speaks to your heart, speaks to your sensibility, speaks within the framework of your culture, of your or your genealogy. Then it will become very close. Then it will become very, very intimate. It's not about just sticking with terms that you have heard. It's about making them your own. And for that you are required to introduce what resonates the most. And once that happens, you will feel how intimate that power feels. How absolutely close, inseparable from your own being, being it feels. So I want you to introduce two more, just to introduce them, and I have mentioned their names before. Chinamasta is that <coughs> the most unusual form of Kali. Literally the one who beheaded herself. And holding her own head in her arm, while drinking the blood that is pouring out of the gaping wound. This striking, surreal almost image is of great significance because this is the metaphor of how far the Kali is prepared to go as the mother. And this, this, what it really, really means. That's the aspect. In Indian tradition, it's considered to be one of the most terrifying images of Kali. More terrifying than the blood leaking Kali with the red tang sticking out of her on the battlefield. Chinamasta is that aspect. But you are to understand the metaphor hidden the deep wisdom of that, of that gesture, which she shows, shows the great length to which the sacrifice goes in order to restore unity. It's as simple as that. And another form of the Shakti is the Sati. Sati, she is the devotion herself. Sati is that aspect of Shakti, which is the first 
principle, first primordial character of Shakti, if you will, as that Sat in Sat Chitananda, which stands for being itself and for eternal truth. That's what the root term Sat means. Sat is that which is true. Just as in that verse, Asatoma Sat Gamaya. So Sati is that eternal truth. And Sati is that eternal devotion. Sati is another aspect of Kundalini. Literally. And for that reason, she shares the pantheon, she shares the if you will, the qualities with the other Shaktis as Lakshmi, Sundari, Lalita, Saraswati. Sati is invoked in, in an act of devotion. She is a devotion herself. There's no one, no one more devoted in the whole of Vedic lore than the Sati herself. So it's that very peaceful, full of sacrifice aspect of the mother. of the spouse that she represents. And I would like to take you again to that to that internal yoga, to that intern, internal alchemy the inner yoga, the inner tantra, the inner tantric process, which, as you can see, consists of these two extremes, two extreme opposites. One is that the necessity of that ignited spark represented by the power of Bhairavi at the base of the spine at the very core of the earth herself and the root chakra and that watery lunar quality somic in nature aspect of sundari at the crown chakra at the crown of the head and it is between these two energies that the yoga unfolds this is where the ascend and descend is what makes it complete. So every phase, every burning phase necessarily culminates in the cooling showers of bliss. So that you know and understand that even if right now some of you are in the midst of that burning process, in the midst of that fire. It is the Sundari aspect that completes the journey successfully. It is the Sundari that literally completes it on the level of the cells of the body. The cells themselves are being filled with that immortal bliss. It is as if that at a row of phases, row of stages, that burning electrical quality of Kundalini, of Bhairavi, of the Holy Spirit,
is being transformed into a qualitatively different form of energy when every cell is simply throbbing and in the stream of awareness as that stream of immortality itself. It's a very subtle experience. It is still there. That power still moves through us as us, but it has a very different quality. So you are invited to see this as a complete process, complete integral process. So this is what I wanted to mention and I want to bring your awareness one more time to where we began, to where we first have started, to that first dyadic relationship of Shiva and Shakti, the relationship between pure awareness and the power of self-awareness. which is exemplified in Prakasha and Vimarsha, Vimarshini sometimes. The Shakti is known as that more endearing, endearing term. Where Prakasha starts for luminosity, that which is ever luminous. And Vimarsha for the power of self-awareness, a reflective power of awareness where it contemplates its own magnificence. And this is the relationship of Shiva and Shakti. It's a universal relationship. All universal relationships are reflections of that relationship. And in terms of the spiritual practice as the foundational grounds, is that equilateral, is that triangle of the self, the guru, and the Ishta Devata, of which we have spoken about, how it meant to be understood, how it meant to be invoked and implemented in our practice, because that is a very dynamic relationship, very dynamic relationship, the Self, Ishta Devata and the Guru. The Guru is that immortal principle, that which conceals and that which reveals. It is always within and always without. It needs to be recognized to receive that guidance. If one is un incapable of recognizing the Guru without, the Guru within could be just that, a possibility of an ego trip, concealing itself under the pretext of self-guidance. And Ishta Devata is that democratically chosen unique aspect of universal power with which you have the most resonance. That aspect which literally is enlivened by the greater light, by the reflection that is unveiled in the relationship with your guide, with your spiritual guide, whose purpose here, sole purpose, is to enliven that aspect within yourself. And that's exactly what we've been doing here. So that that Ishta Devata, that personal aspect of God, takes you to the self, takes you to your own self. And I will remind you again that 
But the mystery and the secret of that it's, it's not that it takes you somehow to transport you through space-time from a place where you are, you are not. But in fact, the Ishta Devata becomes the Self. This is the merging of Shakti with Shiva. And it is for that reason we are encouraged to recognize the Ishta Devata. So the role is here very simple. Each roles are here simply assigned and simply understood. And you can see it now for yourself. You worship all the three. You understand them to be one. You understand them, them to be your very own self. And you know how to use, I'm using it cautiously here, and you know how to use each aspect when it comes to Guru and Ishta Devata. The enlivened Ishta Devata is then literally that power that moves you in greater ways closer to your own self, that's all. It becomes that. When you recognize Shakti, then Shakti simply takes you straight to Shiva, where she is forever united. Then, when you know yourself, how let the ride be that discovery? Because it will happen to each and every one of you, unique, unique to that relationship. So. This, this, in as much as summarizing it somewhat, bring it to a summary.